sort of a mini development of visual effects for a game. And it's sort of a microcosm of the bigger picture of when you're working on bigger games and bigger projects. And there's a lot of lessons I learned from that that I'm going to be sharing with you and how all that applies. So here's the overview of what I'm going to be covering. I'll start out by introducing myself, a little bit of details, get to know me kind of thing. And then I'll dive right into a challenge that I was facing in developing a visual effects style and unifying it. And then some of the solutions, including a singular vision, uh, the different pillars and the style guide techniques that I like to use, how to stay consistent with all the different in-game techniques that you're going over, uh, how to obviously work with other artists and cross-pollinate, and then of course, the amazing result at the end, the hopefully amazing result at the end, right? That's what we're all here for, is to learn how to get great results and how to make awesome creative art. Okay, so the intro. Here's a little bit of what I've done over the years. Uh, I am currently a senior visual effects artist on League of Legends. That basically means that I make magic for a living and I blow stuff up and I get paid to do it. Uh, it also means that I do a lot of things that are very obscure that a lot of people don't have any clue how to do. So as I travel and speak a lot and as I'm online uh, sharing a lot of tutorials and videos and answering emails and on the forums and, and basically conversing with all of you, I get a ton of questions about how this stuff is made and the answer is, well, it's complicated. Uh, it's very much a rabbit hole once you start down the journey of learning visual effects it just goes forever. So that's what I'm doing right now in League of Legends. I uh, make explosions. People ask what I've worked on for League of Legends. Uh, if you're familiar with the game, how, how many of you have played League of Legends? Yeah, a few people in the room, okay. Uh, in the game, there's over 140 champions. Uh, all those champions have different skins. It's basically a completely complete re-theming of the character. This is something that you see in a lot of games these days. And uh, those reskinnings of the characters call for unique visual effects. So, you know, maybe a character that's normally like gritty with like a big gun that shoots gunpowder and explosions decides he's gonna go to the beach and now he has a squirt gun. And so of course we're not gonna have big explosions coming out of his squirt gun, that's not fulfilling the fantasy. So it falls to me to make all the splashes and bubbles and whatever things might be coming out of his various guns as he's fighting in the same environment. So that's what I'm doing today. And before that, I was on a game called Animal Jam. That is a game partnered with National Geographic Kids. And I was there for three and a half years. Oh, by the way, I've been at Riot Games for six years. And I guess it'll be six years in January. And then uh, Powerpuff Girls, I had a short stint uh, doing some concept effects for the Powerpuff Girls show. And they were kind enough to include me in the credits, even though I was doing it for only a month. They still included me, so I included up here because uh, it's legit, right? Uh, that's all it takes is one month and you get a credit. All right, and most recently I'm working on this side project of mine, which is becoming bigger all the time called vfxapprentice.com. That's where I am teaching everyone all the things that I've learned over the years of how to make awesome VFX. And this talk is in conjunction with that class and I'll show some things from that class as I'm going through. All right, so in putting this whole thing together, I had a challenge. The challenge was, how do I get these four things to match and look correct next to each other in a game? Uh, I wanted to have fire, I wanted to have electricity, I wanted to have smoke and goo. Now, this poses a lot of unique problems and you can already see it here. It's like, yeah, they look cool individually, but they might look kind of weird when you start putting them next to each other in, a, say, a video game, right? When you're trying to understand like, okay, well, this character is throwing f slime and this one's throwing fire and that one's got electricity and it just looks like a mess when you're done, right? When they're all happening on top of each other. So how do you get that to work? Uh, this is especially exacerbated because in real life, IRL, they don't look the same at all, right? These look like different games, <laughs> so to speak, even though these are all live, live action footage. So... This is a result, of course, because they're made of different things, right? So fire is composed of, and I looked this up, so this is according to Google. Fire is composed of carbon dioxide, water, vapor, oxygen, and nitrogen, apparently. This is stuff I didn't know before this talk. I was like, what is fire actually made of? Oh, those are the things that it's made of, interesting. Something like electricity is just simply 
electrons that are moving very fast and discharging energy as they do so, right? Smoke is actually mostly water vapor combined with some other small particles. So it's got some overlap with fire, which is actually why they tend to kind of look the same and go together, obviously. Uh, but they are subtly different enough that it's going to require a different technique. And then slime. Slime is really interesting. Slime is actually a crystalline structure that's flooded with water. So like take a crystal that's like really brittle and then flood it with water and you get like this gooey sort of substance. Something like, uh, I think it's borax. Yeah, it's borax, right? That you can like make homemade slime. Uh, if you just mix it with water and shaving cream, you get like that slime. So borax is a crystalline thing, kind of like, it kind of is like salt when you see it. Totally different from fire. So even in real life, these are made differently. So how in the world are we going to expect to be able to make these in a game engine, right? Because we have all these different techniques of how we could possibly make something. So here you're seeing different effects made in sort of different ways. You've got the flame up at the top, which is just a mesh that's kind of waving around and it's got a material that's sort of dissolving as the, the shapes move upward. That kind of looks like a licking flame, right? You've got a mesh that's round and then has vertex offset. So those vertices on the mesh are actually getting bumped out and slid upwards with like a material. And then it's got additive layers and then smoky layers. And then the way that the electricity over here is done is actually just multiple meshes that are static, just sitting there, all sitting on top of each other. And then the texture flips between the different meshes that are in different positions causing it to kind of like look like it's waving around, but it's really just a bunch of static meshes, right? So as an effects artist, all of these are valid. It's not necessarily like the right way to do this is this technique. You can approach this from any number of directions. So how in the world are you going to get things that were made in a variety of ways that look completely different in real life to look the same when they're next to each other in a game? Well, these are exactly the kind of problems I love to solve. Okay, so solution one, let's talk about having a single person kind of hold the vision. And then this is a lot easier actually if you're a small studio because it sort of automatically happens, right? Especially if you're a studio of one. You're the art director, you're the concept artist, you're the VFX artist. How many of you in here kind of fit that description? Yeah, I've met a few of you out on the floor. I think it's admirable, like Herculean effort, trying to do all that all at once. And that's sort of the VFX spirit is I'm, pretty much a generalist. I do a lot of different things, everything from concept art in the very beginning to then like building the textures and the meshes and all that good stuff. Um, by the way, also I love engagement from everybody. So if you think of questions as we're going along, anywhere in this talk, uh, at the end, I'm gonna save some time so that we can chat and I've got a clock. So I'll make sure that I leave enough time for you to ask questions, probably about 10 minutes at the end because I want to hear from you and I want to answer any questions I can. Okay, so this is definitely having this single person is, in my opinion, the easiest way to unify a style. Now, here's four images from the class that we ended up making, and these are all done by the same artist. His name is David Shovelin. He's insanely talented. He works at Riot Games with me, and uh, I knew that I needed his artwork in the class because he's just too good to not share with the world. And so here he has painted each one of these and you can tell that they sort of have the same DNA, the same uh, attention to detail in the right places and the same sort of sensibilities of design because they literally come from the same mind, right? They're, it's one person working on all of them. As he was working on each of them, he was thinking about, you know, a hot focal point in the center where it's brightest, you know, you've got the the point in the center of the flame and the electricity in there, and probably less so in the goo, it's a little more dispersed, but still has that same sense of like drawing your eye towards the middle. And then all of them, of course, uh, radiate outwards. And that was like a design constraint that I gave him was that it needed to feel like a radial area that this was affecting. And so that was all very tightly controlled and very easy to control because it was just me and him corresponding. So on your projects, if your art director is also a concept artist, that's perfect, right? Like they really need to uh, take a little bit of time early on to provide some examples of, hey, here's what it could look like across these different things. If you're a student, 
and uh, you're working on a student project, then uh, having everybody do like a concept for each one. Okay, you do the electricity, you do the fire, you do the smoke. That might be good for your individual portfolios for sure. But at the end of the day, uh, the game's going to suffer because <laughs> guarantee different people are going to have totally different ways of working and their concepts are going to look wildly different from one another. So the key is in this phase is to do a little bit of everything across a wide spectrum. So here I'm pointing out, uh, try not to do two concepts of things that are very similar to each other. It's not gonna be as valuable to the rest of the team if it's like, well, here's like blue fire and here's orange fire, right? Like, okay, we get that orange fire isn't too far off from the blue fire, right? We understand that they're similar. If instead you're doing, well, here's water and here's fire that's going to be so much more valuable to the team because now you're exploring a much wider swath of variation and they're going to start to understand, okay, there's this massive gap between these two, but maybe we can even start filling in in our own minds what might fit between them. Uh, these are some effects, by the way, that uh, I just found online. These are not my own. Um, we're going to see some of those as well. But uh, the key here is like getting good reference and seeing like, okay, I like that image over there. That looks really nice. And this one over here that's something completely different also looks nice. And then bringing them together in a mood board can be very useful at this phase. And definitely explore wide instead of really specific. Okay, so a philosophy. Now, we always talk about style, right? We love the word style. And to me, style is such, it's such a complex topic. It's not just, oh, it looks cool. No, no, no. There's very specific things of why it looks cool, right? Like two very different things can be cool. So we need to be very clear when we're talking with our team about what we mean by cool or I like it or it's awesome or it's epic or whatever, right? So I've watched this fall apart many, many times. Yes, at Riot Games, but also at other companies too. This is human nature here and the nature of working with the team in general, I don't think it's unique to any of us. So this is the formulas that I've discovered that don't work and that make everything horrible. So if you as a team have decided, okay, we want these effects to feel epic in scope and super satisfying, but also really cute, but also edgy. And we want it to feel really fast and exciting all at once. And, and then like, as you're working along, other people are also coming up with other adjectives that they really like. Oh, and it's also gonna be this, and it's also gonna be that. By the end of it all, you have mud, right? By the time you're seeing all of that come together in the game, it's anything but clear. It's just awful. It's a terrible experience for everyone involved. And that's really because the team doesn't have a unified understanding of what you're actually trying to achieve. So what you end up doing is sort of just what everybody has in their own mind, right? Like this guy over here was thinking, yeah, when he said epic and awesome, I was thinking of Breath of the Wild, you know, how those explosions are so epic and awesome. And then over here, you have this gal who's like, well, no, I mean, I was really thinking of something like from, you know, that moment in Assassin's Creed where the building destroys and falls apart and explodes. Well, those are two totally different styles and two totally different use cases. So you really need to be specific and concise. You need to have very clear understanding across your team about exactly what you're going for. And you need to be able to explain it in just a couple of things. And that's where pillars come in. So this is something I learned about at Riot Games. Uh, this is like a fantastic concept that uh, we, we ended up following on the team that really worked well for us. So this idea of pillars and pillars are actually, you think of a pillar, it holds up a structure, right? A pillar actually underlies the style. It actually informs the style. So here's just some examples just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. You only need three pillars. In fact, you really should not have more than three. You could probably have two in most games and be just fine. And a pillar is something that you do not compromise on. It's something that anytime you're evaluating an asset in a review, you're thinking, does it hit the pillar? Does it hit one of the pillars? And if it doesn't hit the pillars, why are we making it? Why is it in the game? Why is it valuable? Because if it's not supporting our pillars, it's probably making things muddy and it's probably detracting from those pillars. Now this applies to all aspects of game development, but specifically today I'm talking about effects style and getting all your effects to look coordinated together and to look correct together. So getting your pillars to match is gonna be super important for you 
even a, in like a portfolio where you're, you're trying to like get a little uh, slice of style. Anybody in here a student? How many students have we got in here? Yeah, quite a few of you. Uh, working professionals? Awesome. So uh, just here for the heck of it? Yeah, there you go. Um, okay, so definitely when you're uh, working on your projects, whether it's like a professional project or a student project, having a nice uh, unity, not literally unity of the game engine, but like a nice unification of your assets is gonna show really nicely and showing your ability to do that. So just to kind of go through this exercise, let's say hypothetically we want a game that has a couple of these. So let's say we want our effects to be packed with personality and then we want them to be invitingly fam familiar. So it's like, okay, you can start to imagine packed with personality and inviting, invitingly familiar. Okay, so maybe like from childhood, you know, that could be one way to do it. And then from there you can start to develop your style, you know, like, okay, so it's gonna have kind of these notes and there's games out there that we love that really are built off of childhood. Or maybe, you know, it's packed with personality and invitingly familiar because it's like the, it's like the workplace environment, like the office, like kind of the mundane things that, that are always happening, but it's like, you know, that day when someone, it's their birthday and so they bring in cake. And it's like that moment, it's like, okay, so it's kind of casual but awkward and inviting or something like that, right? Like you could go any number of directions with it, but then you start overloading it. It's like, but we also want it to be intensely aggressive. Okay, well, so it's a workplace environment, it's aggressive. Okay, that could be weird, but it's kind of fun still, but oh, but also a compelling spectacle. Oh, okay, so now it's also, and you can start to see how quickly it gets muddy and you're like, what the heck are we making, right? Like, this is too many pillars. And so really just two or three is what you want to go with. All right, so that's pillars. And after you've got your pillars, you start figuring out your style. Now, this is a picture from the League of Legends style guide. You can actually find that on Riot Games' website. We posted it for free for the world. And it's just a PDF you can download. And it was done by my mentor and good friend, Jin Yang. He's an amazing effects artist. And he took the time to go through and screenshot all these assets from the game and just talk about what it is that we're aiming for. This is great for us internally. It's great for our outsourcing partners. It's great for just everything, really, to try and get an understanding of how do we accomplish what we accomplish specifically. And we can put that into the hands of the new artists that are coming on and show them, okay, here. Here's what good looks like. Here's what bad looks like, right? So on this specific example, we've got highly detailed, highly rendered uh, assets on the left. And then we've got the more simplified, straight to the point sort of assets on the right. And you can see how those play out in game where it's like lots of busy detail is not something we want to go for, but then nice fluid shapes that sort of blend together and give a clear area of effect are definitely what we want to go for in League of Legends. And I mean, just from looking at this and then reading just a couple lines of text, you have a very successful page of a style guide, right? And it, it can always harken back to the pillars. I mean, in League of Legends, clearly competitive clarity is really important to us because it's a competitive game that's played on large esports stages around the world. And so it's very important to us that it's not busy and loud and unclear what's happening. So the players aren't pulling their hair out, getting super frustrated, right? So definitely, uh, you know, pay attention to what matters to you on your project and what your project's individual pillars are. Okay, so another solution, and by the way, you're not limited to just one or two solutions. Hopefully you're doing all of these, which would be great, uh, is using consistent techniques. Now, this comes into play where you're talking about the very technical aspects of how your game is actually put together. Here's a very clear example of, on the left, you've got procedurally generated uh, textures that are made by a computer for computers. No, it's not necessarily true. A lot of procedural textures work actually very well in a lot of games, but you also might want hand-painted textures, right? That have this totally different sensibility to them. And you can use these textures in literally the same effects asset. It's just how you created them really matters when it comes to your style. Like if you had two explosions in your game and one of them used the textures on the left and the other one used the textures on the right, they probably would not look like they belong together, right? Because they're created from a different source and a different technique. So the more you can get your artist to use similar techniques to one another, the more your style is gonna sort of automatically line up. 
All right. Uh, yeah, next up you want to define what that is. Like, okay, so what's the conventional way to do goo or liquids for that matter? So here we've got, you know, an example that's very material driven on the top. That's like, okay, it's got like frosted tops of snow that could also be like foamy goo that's like receding away from the land. This is how we do that stuff in our game is like we do a material solution where it sort of like oozes away from a height map and it, it kind of nicely flows off like that, right? Or in the bottom example, I actually painted a flip book frame by frame of that goo splattering outward. And then we had other cards of particles that were floating up away from it. For those of you who aren't familiar with what a flip book is, that's just a 2D animation. Basically, it's just drawn frame by frame. And then we put that on a 3D card in the environment. And that's just all that's happening on the ground there is it's like splattering outward and then like dissolving away. So two very different techniques. Uh, generally speaking, in League of Legends, if we're going to do a splatter, it's going to use a dissolve, right? It's going to just like have that splatty shapes and then just sort of eat away versus having something that's like paying attention to how the terrain is formed or anything like that. We don't really worry about that. Okay. The fourth solution is cross-pollination between artists. And this is one that's really near and dear to my heart, obviously, because I'm here from Los Angeles cross-pollinating with all of you. I love these conferences. I think these are really uh, the heart and soul of the industry is where we can come together and like from the newbies who are just getting started in school to the seasoned old fogies like myself that are just like, been, they've been doing this for like 10 plus years. We can all come together and uh, share knowledge together. And that's really gonna help uh, as we sort of discuss and figure out how we're gonna make this stuff. It's gonna help tie it all together and create really great styles in our games. So if you don't take a picture of any other slides uh, on this presentation, please take a picture of this one. Realtimevfx.com is a fantastic community that is international. Uh, it was founded by my good friend, uh, Keith Garrett. He is the owner of Beyond Effects, which is a VFX outsource studio that works for a lot of large game companies. And it's fantastic. So it was founded by him, but honestly, we feel like it's ours. All of us uh, in the VFX community from around the world, we all contribute. We uh, throw breakdowns in there. Here's a breakdown on the uh, right side by my good friend, uh, Shannon Burke. She also works at Riot Games. And then uh, we've got other examples over here on the left side as well from other community members. Uh, some of the things I showed you earlier were from people in our community. There's just a wealth of knowledge of how to create this stuff. Everybody's always asking me, how do I get started? Where do I go when I wanna learn more about VFX? This is where we go in that community. Uh, the next one would be internal meetings. So you at your studio, if you're big enough and you have more than one visual effects artist, should be putting those artists together, right? They should have some time to sort of, if they're not sitting by each other already, to uh, get in a room together and sort of jam on ideas and talk about, hey, what are you uh, working on right now? Like, what are some ideas? Let's literally use the, the whiteboard and like, you know, diagram it out or like little pieces of paper to just sketch out different ideas. Is this going to be on a mesh? Is this going to be on a card? What's your texture going to look like? Oh, what if it moved like this? Oh, have you played that game? Oh, they do something like that in that game. Maybe you should go reference that and you could pull that off. So all the time at Riot, we are having these meetings. Uh, we actually call it campfire. We have it once a week and all, all of us get together. I don't even know how many of us there are. There's a whole bunch of us from all the different departments. And we all come together as visual effects artists and we just chat. It's like, what games are you guys playing? What are you learning about? Like, how's, how's life treating you, you know? Uh, and it's really a good chance to connect and to stay unified. And it ends up honestly uh, unifying the style because we cross pollinate so much with one another and sharing all these techniques that even though techniques are so wildly different from one another, if I give this person technique A and they give me B, then we're both using A and B now and that unifies the style sort of automatically. And then of course there are big meetups and uh, workshops. You have them at local levels, regional levels, and like this conference, international levels. So these are some photos from the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco that we have every year in March. And that's a really fun one. This is the uh, round table session. So those are all visual effects artists for games specifically. We call ourselves the real-time VFX community because our effects render in real time as opposed to pre-rendered like in, in most films. So 
we get together in this group that's honestly, it's getting a little big. <laughs> it's just like wall to wall, like industry veterans and just pros that I, I look up to and admire. These are fantastic people. And then mixed in with the room as well are a bunch of students and newcomers and indie developers that don't really have a connection to the community that like to come out and connect there. Uh, I heard that there's m local meetups in many of the major cities in New Zealand where game developers come together, not just VFX artists, but all kinds of game developers come together and share knowledge there. And I, like, just I'm sure all around the world, there's lots of opportunities. I don't know what you, you do in India. I'm sure there's different meetups besides this one as well. If not, seriously consider uh, heading that up. You'll find that your community grows and flourishes at a very rapid rate when you start combining together like that. I know oftentimes studios feel like, oh, this is, this is our secret sauce. We can't share the recipe with everyone else. We have to keep it to ourselves. But uh, in my experience, All Ships Rising really benefits everybody. And I would encourage it, even though maybe uh, some studio heads might not. But oh well, I guess that's up, up to your studio's discretion, what they are and are not willing to share. Okay, so after I've had all that time to like share knowledge and work with David Shovelin on his unifying style of like painting all the effects manually and so forth, we ended up with this result. So here uh, are the four effects that we had concepted out, fully animated in the class that are functioning. And what's great about this is we're able to actually package all these together because we use the same technique. I followed my own advice. They all use one shader, so it's just one material across all of these, except for the goo. The goo, uh, Shovelin wanted to get fancy with the goo. So he made a custom shader just for the goo that has like faux lighting and stuff to get those specular highlights on it. Um, but generally speaking, it's all the same. And so when students go through it now, it's intelligible, understandable, they can get it. And for a live project, this is also super valuable because if you've done it all in a consistent way, now when you add a new member to the team, onboarding them, training them, getting them up to speed is gonna be so much easier because it's like, oh yeah, okay, I learned one thing and now I know how to do 20 things versus like everything is custom, everything is unique, it's done by a different artist with a different way. And if you're not thinking about that early on, it will come back to bite you. It has definitely bitten us at Riot <laughs> more than once. And I'm sharing these lessons out of my failures, so please learn from my failures. Uh, but the nice thing in the class is like, uh, if, you, if you do end up going on there, you'll find you get on there and it's like, oh, it's just all, it all just works. It's all unified. And uh, once you've learned how one effect is built and kind of dissected it and pulled it apart, learning the other ones is much easier because they're using the same kinds of techniques, right? Now, that's just not to say when you try to go on after the class and then learn other styles that are more like PBR or high definition or like photorealistic, yeah, you're definitely gonna have to start that learning curve all over again, but we're gonna work on that too. That's coming up down the line. Uh, but for now, this is just sort of a microcosm of how to unify across one style. Okay, so to wrap it up, this is what we went over for anybody who came in later on. Uh, having a single concept artist is amazing. A strong style philosophy with pillars that guide your art style and inform that is critical. Uh, definitely uh, trying to use consistent techniques if possible. I know if you're doing goo versus electricity, maybe it's not gonna be super consistent. You might wanna do a frame by frame zap on the lightning and then the goo as a dissolve. But at least uh, having them in, as like near neighbors and sort of how they operate is gonna help you a lot. And then of course, cross-pollination between artists, which is exactly what we're doing right now, is going to help you a lot. All right, so that's the talk. Thank you for coming.